Uh, welcome to another uh, Coffee with Samso. Uh, this episode, I've got Simon Mitchell here talking uh, about Southern Goal. Uh, they're at uh, South Korea. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story in the sense that it's all about epithermal goal. Uh, a lot of viewers may sort of think that's just another jargon that we throw up, but it's, uh, it's, it's a different mix. Uh, Simon, maybe you could just give us a good rundown on yourself uh, and then yeah, tell us a story. Okay, that's a big, uh, big opening there, Noel, for what could be a long story. Uh, look, I, from a personal perspective, <clears throat> I'm a geologist by background, but I also did a lot of time in banking and finance. Uh, so I'm a bit of a, a, a dangerous mix of a geologist slash finance person. Uh, and, and, you know, that gives me a certain perspective. Part of my background actually was in Korea uh, when I was in business development for a uranium company and I was trying to get the Koreans to invest in a particular uranium project. Uh, so that's probably where my association with Korea started personally. Uh, but I got involved or interested in this gold uh, targeting story in Korea back in sort of 2013. <clears throat> I was managing director of an unlisted public company at the time uh, that had sort of put together a bit of a core, uh, core group of projects in Korea. And I was involved in that for a couple of years, but when I joined Southern Gold, I kept my eye on it and uh, basically ultimately did a deal with that company and brought it onto the stock exchange. Uh, we, you know, as you probably can appreciate, 2016-17 was a bit tight for cash. Uh, we were getting a bit of money from a gold mine in Western Australia, uh, which was being developed by West Gold. That kind of kept the lights on to a certain extent. Uh, but we didn't really have the funding to do the story in Korea justice. It's sort of a big, big project, lots of stuff going on there. And, and then, you know, we obviously said, we'll fast forward a few years and we've just raised a, a good block of money now. Uh, and that will enable us to really get our teeth into the story in the next couple of years. So, you know, we've really been, we've, we've gone out and got uh, the backing of very technically savvy cornerstone investors, people who have taken 10, 17% of the company, uh, the top, you know, half a dozen or so people have about half the company. So that gives you an idea about the, the conviction of the people that have got right behind this story. What we could do with a bit more of is a bit more interest on the retail side, a bit more liquidity on the ASX. Uh, and that's something that I've got to work on is to get the, get the kind of Korean story out there and why it might be interesting and why people might want to get their teeth into it. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually was uh, very curious how you came about all these projects. Um, I mean, I, I, I sort of knew of South Korea through my time with my other listed entity when we were looking at the uh, Tungsten project there. And I suddenly realized that there is it's actually as perspective. But, um, um, many people don't think much about South Korea because it's not in your no. as much as Africa or or South America, etc. But um, the, 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 when I look at your your projects, your your, your um, portfolio, it, there's a, you seem to have almost taken up the whole entire Korean Peninsula. Um, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, just just give us a, a, a sort of a general concept of what you're looking. For. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it, it, there is probably, um, well, we've got what it might, on a, on a map of Korea, it might look like we're kind of covering the whole country. It would be fair to say that a fair chunk of our projects are in the southwestern corner. And, and that's because we're targeting these epithermal type deposits. And we think that that belt of rocks in that corner there are very prospective for that style of mineralization. Korea itself, though, is prospective for all sorts of things. So, yeah, Tungsten is definitely a, a possibility, and it's in, in the northeast of the country. That's definitely prospective for that. In fact, it's got world-class tungsten deposits. Um, <clears throat> there are some other commodities as well. However, it would be fair to say, Noel, that Korea is not a really well-developed mining nation, and part of it is that they, they took a very deliberate um, what's the word, pathway into advanced manufacturing back in the 1970s. And sort of mining became a, a kind of a secondary issue, if you will. And so it's sort of flown a bit below the radar screen. And, and, and to, to be fair, Korea is also not 
that easy a nut to crack for a foreign company. It's, you know, there's language barriers, there's some social issues, it's got a high population density. Uh, the tenure system is a little bit unusual. And so for a foreign company, there's a bit of a steep learning curve. And that's one of the reasons, you know, why I love Southern Gold as this vehicle, because we've kind of learned all those lessons. We've really built the position over a period of time. And we're by far and away the most advanced group that is involved in the country. Um, going to your question about the nature of our projects, we're fundamentally looking for precious metals. So we're not interested in the tungsten. So we're not out there looking at the base metals and other things that might be prospected in Korea. Uh, we're focused on precious metals. And it would be fair to say that the style of mineralization that we're targeting, these epithermal styles, it, it's really something that hasn't um, been explored there historically in the past by Koreans. The Koreans have been mining gold on the peninsula for nearly a thousand years, right? And But they've mainly been exploiting what are these big orogenic systems, these sort of uh, big white bucky quartz veins sticking out of the ground. They've gone in and mined those, you know, pro projects like Gubong and Muguk and things like that. And these projects are a very different style to what we're, what we're looking for. And here's the key. One of the reasons why we're looking for these epithermal deposits, Noel, is that the understanding of this style of mineralization is relatively recent, even in Western context. So, you know, you wind back to the 1970s and it was probably really very early days in that kind of type of style of mineralization. We start to kind of really understand it perhaps in the 1980s or late 1980s is when we started to kind of really hunt these things down. And it was probably not until the 1990s that we had some very good success on that front. So even in the West, our understanding and our ability to target these systems and indeed drill them properly has really been a relatively recent phenomena. And indeed, and I made that comment before about how there hasn't been a lot of exploration in Korea. Well, that the exploration that has occurred sort of predates this understanding of this deposit type. And so a big part of what we're doing is we're sort of deploying this sort of new technical understanding into a jurisdiction that really hasn't seen much exploration of this style. Oh. The only other example that we had in Korea where this style of mineralization was targeted was back in the 1990s when the Ivanhoe Group, which was called Indochina Goldfields at the time, by the way, but the, the old Robert Friedland Group uh, was, was exploring Korea. In fact, they had some success. They found three different projects uh, before they left the country. And a big part of our story, the Southern Gold story, is that we've gone back to a lot of the guys involved in those days. And you know, basically I said to them, do you want to restart? Let's, let's relaunch that, that, um, that uh, initiative that was unfinished back in the 90s. And if you're wondering why it was unfinished, it was because Ivanhoe, they made those discoveries in Mongolia, right? And they were big, you know, big world-class systems. And so it was an understandable decision. They basically, you know, left Korea to concentrate on something which was company making in Mongolia. But what it meant though, is that there was a lot of unfinished business in Korea, and in particular, unfinished business in terms of exploration of these epithermal style mineralization. So that's really what we're about, is that we're, we're targeting a belt of rocks that's never really been explored properly uh, for this particular style of mineralization. In terms of, um, the, I remember when we first met in, in, in Adelaide, we, um, you showed me the rocks and epithermal has, in my mind, uh, it, they're very exotic looking rocks. They are very um, <laughs> chemically, uh, very flamboyant, you want to say, with the, with the, with, with the mineralization. Yeah. Easier to find, uh, it, or being in, is there any advantage that you're finding in, in uh, South Korea? Or is, just, just share with us your thoughts on, on the system, because I think that there, there's, there's some importance in terms of where you, what you can get by finding, by looking for this style of mineralization. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is, there's probably um, two layers to our answer of that, Noel. So let, let's go with your comment about the exotic looking rocks and, and you know, why is this interesting? 
Um, yeah, they, they can look really funky actually. And, and what, what it is about is that we're talking about rocks which have got sort of fluid flow. There's like fluids which are mineralized that are running through structures. And they're doing so under a particular kind of chemical and pressure regime. And so the, so the geological environment in which these things occur is quite sort of specific. And the sub-geological environment where not only do these things occur, but they occur with high levels of precious metals, that's another niche again, right? So it, in a sense, it is a quite of a niche type of target. Now, the reason that we, you know, why would we bother? Like, why are we persevering with something that's quite, you know, difficult to track down? And the reason is that, that, that often you can get good indicators that you're on the right track by actually understanding the technical signs and reading the rocks, if you will, looking at those funky rocks that you were talking about. They can actually provide really critical clues of where you are in the system so that when you do subsequent drilling, you've got a fairly good understanding of where you're sort of sitting in the system and where you, if, we, if you were going to be successful, where you should target. Now, you're not going to be successful all the time. That's the thing about epithermals. They aren't quite tricky. But why, why persevere with them? Well, the key is that if you get the right combination of structure and chemistry and all the technical elements all come together, you can end up with a deposit, which is very high grade, has got widths, which are mineable by mechanized methods. And so therefore, you end up with a very strong economic project. Very, very robust. In fact, so robust, you probably don't even really need to worry too much about the gold price. That's how robust these things can be. And if you find a big one of them, well, then even better. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a what we call a tier one uh, epithermal deposit. And, and I guess the most classic example of that in the near neighborhood of where we're looking is, is in Hishikari uh, in Japan. And uh, we believe there's some very strong parallels uh, between the sort of two environments. Japan's different. I don't want to say that they're the same, uh, but there are very strong parallels in terms of those sort of two uh, sets of geology, if you will, south, the sort of southwestern corner of Japan and, and Korea have got some very, very good parallels. In, when, you, um, when you touched on the high grade of the deposit, obviously the Kori uh, deposit, if, if I'm not mistaken, is, is double digits kind of grades in terms of, of what they're mining. Um, the, in, in every in every style, and I mean, you talk about you know porphyry is a uh, big and very low grade, and uh, yeah. it can be very you know relatively small, but uh, you know it, it's it's cheaper to find. Where does epithermal sit in terms of you know how much you have to spend and what you get at the end of the day? Yeah, well, you can get a very wide range of outcomes. So let's let's use a couple of examples, Noel. So when when Ivanhoe made its discoveries in southwestern Korea before it went to Mongolia, it found a number of projects, Unsan, Moisan, and Gasado Island. Now, we don't have access to the production, uh, the kind of historical production there, because it's held by a private company. However, we've got a fairly good idea of roughly speaking how big those deposits are. And we're probably talking about somewhere between 100 and 200,000 ounces. It's something like that. Uh, and, and probably an average grade of about eight grams per tonne gold equivalent. So that's a pretty good grade for an underground mine. That will make money. Uh, it's not the world's biggest deposits or, or cluster of deposits, uh, but it's a very solid economic proposal. And so that's, that's obviously made a bit of money over the decades. Now, taking a, a more extreme example on the other end of the spectrum, Hishikari, which is the one I mentioned in Japan, it's got a life of mine grade of somewhere between 30 and 40 grams per tonne. So it's more than an ounce per tonne. And it's, and it's been mining that for its entire mine life since the early 80s. And so, so far it's mined, they've mined about 7 million ounces from that deposit. And they've got another 5 million ounces or so in reserve going forward. So that's a 12 million ounce deposit at north of a ounce per tonne grade. And so you can imagine that that would be an extremely profitable mine and one with very long life. 
that's an extreme example. <laughs> and you've got the two end members uh, between the two. But clearly what Southern Gold is looking for is something that is, you know, tier one, similar to the Hishikari style, uh, which is a big, big prize. And look, we're, we're likely to find perhaps a couple of those smaller ones, a bit like the Unsuns, the Moisuns, uh, the discoveries that uh, Ivanhoe made. You know, in the short term, we might find one or two of those on that journey to finding the big one. Uh, touch wood that we're lucky enough to do so. In terms of the epithermal story, uh, is it correct in my understanding that there tend to be shallow deposits or discovery points of discovery as opposed to more deeper? Uh, not necessarily. You can be lucky and you can have an epithermal deposit close to surface uh, if it's been eroded to the sort of paleo uh, water table horizon at the right sort of level, and you're kind of lucky enough to hit the sweet spot close to surface. So that can occur. And in fact, that's what happened with Ivanhoe when they found Unsun, because there was Bonanza grades just below surface there. Um, probably more likely is that you will hit it uh, at some depth and at a very specific structural position which has been conducive to the, the movement of the fluids and the dropping out or the chemical, chemical and pressure kind of equilibriums that occur at a particular spot. And, and so that, that can sometimes take a bit of sleuthing. Using that Hishikari as an example, uh, that, that's actually at some depth and it was at, a, uh, at an unconformity level. There's a sequence of rocks sitting on the top and when they've got, they were basically targeting the boundary between two different rock suites and at that very specific level, that's where they were successful. Um, but they were able to get the indicators, if you will, at that shallower level and, and keep drilling down until they hit the good stuff. So uh, as long as you kind of uh, keep your left eye on the, the, the sort of technical clues that you get along the way, uh, you, can't, you shouldn't be intimidated by the idea that it might be a bit deeper down because the grades are so high that it will sustain uh, underground mining at some depth. And, and I believe your epithermal systems tend to be sort of gold, silver, copper. In, in, is, there, is there a like a magic mix of equal amounts of the, the, the gold and the silver or, or, and copper, or is it mainly just gold really? And the rest are just, just bystanders. Yeah, well, you, you can definitely find base metals in epithermal systems, depending on where you are within the system. You know, so if you so basically you get what's called a, in the epithermal system, they call it a zonation model. So they can often work out where you are in the system, depending on the context or the content, uh, the mineralization content of the veins. So for example, uh, you might have a, a, a certain chemistry and position in the epithermal system where the silver grades are very high. So you've got you know, a high, high amount of silver compared to the gold. The gold will still be the economic driver. So the gold content is primary. And then it's just about how much silver uh, credit you're going to get, if you will, uh, in, in that system. So. And, you, and, in, and in epithermals, you can get very strong, very wide ranges of outcomes on that front. Uh, let's take a simple example. Um, Hishikari can have uh, uh, very high gold grades and silver grades. The gold equivalent grades are, you know, 5,000 grams per tonne type stuff in the really super high grade zone, which is, you know, off the charts type grades. Um, at Unsun, where Ivanhoe made its discovery, the gold grades and silver grades were, were both fairly high, but not quite as high as that. Uh, but again, we're talking maybe several thousand grams per tonne uh, silver and a couple of hundred grams per tonne gold in the Bonanza zone. So uh, very high grades, um, but uh, you, know, uh, you, you can get a full range. You mentioned copper before. That, that might occur in terms of, um, uh, say, uh, intrusives or, you know, not necessarily in the epithermal veins, but proximal to it, um, you know, part of the system, but, but not really the economic target, if you will. Uh, it's sort of a, a, an adjunct to, but not really the driver of the, of the exploration. The same goes for lead and zinc. You'll often see elevated levels of lead and zinc in these systems. 
uh, and you might find base metal veins say deeper down into the system, uh, but that's not really why you're there. Uh, it's sort of perhaps a technical indicator, but not the driver uh, of uh, the economy. I guess in some ways, um, the the whole scenario is obviously, you know, like uh, just like views to get the concept is that, you know, you're chasing really high grades um, and, and everything has its costs. Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of South Korea, obviously you, you've got, uh, is, it, is it densely populated or where you guys are, it's, it's sparsely populated? And it, has that, is that an issue? Or is that more of a hindrance or is that a positive for you? Uh, it can be a hindrance, you know, so basically what we've had to do with our exploration work is we, we carve out all the areas where there's high population densities around major cities or major towns and things like that. Uh, and look, at the end of the day, you, you know, Korea has got a population of about 50 million people and it's an area that's about half the size of Victoria. So for an Australian, you know, putting it in perspective, you've got a country that's got double the population in an area half the size of Victoria. So yes, that's definitely an issue. And we're certainly not exploring around Seoul, for example. <laughs> we're one of the world's biggest cities and, you know, we're well and truly away from that. Now, having said that, most of that 50 million population is concentrated in half a dozen cities in Korea. And so there is, you know, other major cities like Daejeon and, and Pohang and things like that, Gwangju in the, in the south. And so you've got these major cities where most people live. In the regional areas, the population density is not too bad, but you've always got a small town or a little hamlet that may be one or two kilometres away from wherever you're working. So you definitely have to have a community engagement program uh, you're not going to be like in Australia where you're in the middle of nowhere and the, you know, the next person's 100 kilometres away. It's nothing like that. And so we have to, from day one, we're very much actively involved in the engagement and discussions with local people. And that's a sort of subtle thing that you probably don't see it in a corporate presentation. Uh, and, you know, but I, I, I hint at it. Like, you know, one of my presentations you might have seen, I have a photograph of the Korean team uh, which I believe is a differentiating factor with Southern Gold. We've got a, a fairly substantial team in Korea. Most of them are geologists, but we've got a couple of guys who are involved in community relations. And we take that stuff very seriously from day one. And, you know, you need to be able to do that to navigate the system in Korea. Uh, and if you don't take that seriously, you know, you're not going to have a long-term future there. So... We've been doing that. I believe we've got a very good reputation in country now, uh, something that I think the government has recognised. And the proof in the pudding on that, Noel, is that um, many companies have tried to go into Korea and have not succeeded in having tenure granted to them, uh, whereas Southern Gold has had a whole series of projects granted over time. And we have a new project granted by the government probably every six months or so. So that really indicates, um, you know, that we've got, you know, good relations with the regulators and, and typically with local people too. With, with, with many companies, just like yourself, and, and I've just had conversation, um, you know, Matador Mining and things like who are working in Canada, and you're, in, you're obviously in Korea, um, and you touched on the fact that you've got um, sort of local geologists, technical team, which, which is, it's just, you know, uh, what keeps, companies like yourself moving forward. With, you know, the, 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 the big sort of um, uh, bubble issue that we were facing with COVID, how is that affecting and how are you guys um, sort of overcoming the issue? Yeah, so it, it's definitely had some impact on our operations in, in the sense that um, a, an important component of what we do is the project generation work. And, and basically what sits behind this story is that we're effectively a country play and we've got about, well, we have over a hundred targets that we've identified across the country. We only talk about a few of them, uh, but we've got technical guys who are obviously involved in assessing those targets over time. And so that project generation work is quite important. Now, the, the impact of COVID has been since about March of, or March of earlier this year, 
we haven't been able to get these technical experts on the ground. And so our ability to execute that has been somewhat constrained. We've done a little bit of work where we've been able to have the Korean groups go out and check certain things that um, you know, we were able to identify or may have had a first look at late last year and just required some follow-up and things like that. Um, but what we've had to do to kind of cope with the situation, Noel, is that uh, we've, we've focused our energy on executing some drill programs. And so the Korean team has been largely involved in the, you know, the setting up of drill programs, executing that, uh, and, and keeping our exploration momentum by testing a, a number of these projects. With the project generation work, we do most of that between sort of November and let's say about April of each year, which is through the winter and post winter. And the reason for that is that the, that post winter, all the, all the vegetation has died off because of the snow and the snow melt. And it's a really good time to go in there and do the mapping and assessment, the, the on the ground, get the boots on the ground, technical assessment. And that's something that we hit pretty hard early in the year. What I'm hoping, touch wood, is that we're able to reactivate that just in time before we start to get too much overgrowth in some of these new areas to get the expatriates across to Korea. Of course, we've got to wait and see how the whole vaccine slash COVID thing pans out in the next couple of months. But, uh, you know, we're quietly hopeful that things will start to reopen. Perhaps not, I'm not expecting that to be the case in, say, January and February. Uh, but maybe by the time we get to April, it's, it sort of would have ha hopefully been at least reopened for business purposes and uh, we can get a bit more rolling again. Um, but in any event, I think it's more a case of uh, when rather than if uh, we'll get guys back on the ground. Uh, but we'll keep drilling in the meantime. We're going to be drilling all through winter. We've got a lot of targets ahead of us. Uh, and so we'll keep the ball rolling that way in the short term. Yeah, I think the good news for everyone is you know, it's probably looking, uh, things will probably get better than before. I think when, when things hit, we had a conversation uh, not not long after the um, March. Uh, yeah. Every it, a lot of things were unknown still, and but I think now as uh, we've just had a discussion prior to the recording, that things since we will get to a point where we can live practically with all the issues that that are, are there. That's right. Yeah. Going forward, in terms of news floor, um, I know you've touched on a fair bit on it as as we've spoken. Uh, 12 months, 18 months, you know, what, what can you, what, what, what's a plan that's going to be executable uh, over that time and what's most likely will happen? Yeah, yeah. And so look, I, I, th I think uh, in terms of us perhaps getting some recognition in the retail investor market and that traction on the stock exchange in Australia, it's probably, it, it will require us to start hitting good mineralized intercepts in drill holes where people can suddenly go, oh, okay, the technical thesis holds together and, you know, uh, away Southern Gold goes because it's, it's, it's got a number of things on the fly and it's been able to demonstrate good grades uh, in drill core. We did do that to a certain extent at Athlay where we did get some high grade in relatively narrow intercepts. Uh, bearing in mind that was the scout programs, the first drill holes that Southern Gold had put into that target. So it was very, very early days. And we we're quite pleased to actually hit grade in the first program there. And so, you know, clearly there's something going on there. And, and we're flying geophysics, we'll go back there for round two. And if we can demonstrate there's something more substantive going on there, then, you know, that becomes a project that people kind of go, okay, so they're, they're onto something at that project. What else is going on? If we can then secure, you know, a good high grade intercept in another project, let's say in the next 12 to 18 months, I think that will change perceptions a bit because it'll be a case then of people going, well, you know, after, uh, you know, testing a number of projects, we've hit a couple of them, they're, you know, they're moving forward on a couple of projects. And, you know, this sort of technical idea of the epithermal targets in Korea is sort of really holding up then the question becomes, okay, well, how big can these things be and how many of them are there? And then, you know, the penny will drop that the situation with Southern Gold is a little bit like what it was like for those early explorers going into the Santa Cruz region in Argentina or something like that, where, you know, people didn't really understand the kind of technical context and 
then suddenly it became a big thing and you know every man and his dog wanted to be in there uh and and you know obviously a lot of discoveries were made off the back of that kind of rush so you know we're at the beginning of that process really here in Korea and you know people are still the penny still hasn't dropped except with a couple of very technically astute investors who are really our cornerstone investors they kind of get it um they're not expecting us to necessarily hit that really high grade intercept on our next drill hole they know that there's a process you've got to test a number of things we're going to have some disappointments and we'll we'll have some, some surprises as well on the way so they know it's a journey requires funding requires conviction and perseverance and uh and that's we've got all those things and the fact that we raise that money enables us to really give this a good crack uh and so investors in us now know that we're not come raising and we can go out there and while the success might not come next week it's a matter of time and process and good good technical capability and the right people on the ground and that's all stuff that we we bring to the table and that that's what i hope will become really apparent over the next 12 months no going to your question that's the exploration part the other little part of it is that uh, i've got a fairly long association with korea and got a good network there i'm hoping to leverage that a little bit more in the next sort of let's say the next 6 months or so i can't talk too much in detail about it but i'm working on some project generate not project generation but more kind of corporate development stuff that is leveraging some of the korean uh, companies and prospectors in country and what that might bring to the table uh, for a company such as us and that that can be quite exciting actually and perhaps a little has a little bit more of a, an advanced project or more development nature about it uh, rather than these sort of greenfield opportunities that we're currently doing okay i also noticed you just lately you you put an announcement uh, of divesting a couple of um, jvs uh, yeah and the, and going to be paid out for it uh, that's i assume that's some sort of part of the the corporate strategy to maybe streamline what you've got and and again following what you've just mentioned it sounds like you guys are uh with your relationship there could be looking at something a bit more advanced uh is is would that be correct yeah to a degree that's right no i i think um obviously you know our joint venture partner is london listed bluebird merchant ventures and it would be fair to say and this was flagged in our releases to the stock exchange we southern gold took a different view to bluebird about the time frames to development um the ability to execute a project at the moment with the covid pandemic and the timing impacts of that and southern gold took the view that it would be very difficult to deploy a project development team at this time and uh, particularly you know getting foreigners in there to kind of execute um and and so you know the ability to kind of really get traction on those projects was somewhat limited in the short term in my view and so and there was also another sort of subsidiary issue which was to say that the ability for southern gold to really talk about those projects and to promote them was quite constrained because there wasn't a lot in the you know we didn't have a jork resource it was difficult to talk about the economic framework and uh, and so you know uh we weren't getting a lot of value for that joint venture and and i think the proof of that putting in that was the result of the independent valuation that was announced last monday and you know his putting it into perspective now you know we're a 20 million dollar company with 10 million dollars in the bank so our enterprise value is about 10 million dollars right and the independent expert has come up with a value of our interest in those joint venture projects which is 13.5 million australian right and so no matter what how you do the sums or the math it just doesn't make any sense with regard to where our share price is it's worth about 6 and a half cents australian to our share price in terms of embedded value now you know that that was one of our arguments is that we were really not getting full value for that joint venture and hopefully through this process uh, we will get to a destination where that becomes more apparent now that the value has been determined by an expert it just becomes a question about how does bluebo pay for it so we've got a price and now it's a case of a, a discussion around how they pay that price and that's a good problem for us to have we can see you know have the discussions and uh, whatever way we cut it uh southern gold is going to be way ahead of where it was at the beginning of the process 
Um, and it's just interesting that in the last few days, we've seen a very muted reaction from the market. So, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that other than to the fact that perhaps people are waiting to see how the consideration is settled. And while it might be 13.5 million Australian as a, as a valuation, how does that crystallize into tangible outcomes? And so perhaps that's what being, is being waited for. Um, and hopefully we'll have an, have an answer to that very shortly. All right. Um, I guess, you know, for, for viewers, I think that what the idea with Southern Gold was just to showcase, you know, something uh, of a different mineralization system. Uh, and, and the fact that it's an expiration for, for a different target. Uh, I, I like the story because it's, it's uh, uh, you're in an area that, that you've been targeted, you're, you're, you've got a nice, nice spread of portfolio, the relationship with the um, uh, foreign body is good. Uh, it, like, you, like, like Simon has said, it's, it's an expiration play and expiration play takes time. There's no such thing as an overnight success, these kind of things. Um, yeah. Look, for viewers, feel free to send us comments. Uh, of lately, you guys have been doing a lot of that. It's good. I mean, Simon, I'm pretty sure we'll be happy to get comments as well. Um, Absolutely. You need to click on those likes and subscribe to the to the channel. Uh, Simon, look, thank you for for giving us time. Um, any last words? You know, sell your soul to buy your stock. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think we're very good buying at the moment. Because it goes to, if you look at the underlying value, you know, whatever, when they, when that, um, the deal with Bluebird is consummated and it's turned into, uh, you know, hard consideration, whatever that combination might be, it might be a bit of cash, it might be uh, some shares, you know, we'll wait and see uh, what's ultimately resolved there. But what, whatever way you cut it, you can see that investors at the moment are effectively getting the expiration play for free under the relative valuation model. So that's a brilliant time to accumulate our stock. We've got a negative enterprise value effectively. So, you know, if you like good, you know, you'd like those sort of plays where you've got an exploration story that's a little bit different. It's going into a jurisdiction that hasn't seen much action. So it's new. We're first movers, got a fantastic technical team. I haven't talked too much about that today, uh, but we've got people like Doug Kerwin involved. Uh, some of these people that were from the Ivanhoe group back in the 90s, I did talk about that. So we've got first class people involved. You know, Paul Whitler is our exploration manager and has you know, really pushed the team forward really well in the last year. And so you know, we, we, we feel like we're in a really good sweet spot at the moment, well-funded, tick a lot of technical boxes, and uh, now we've just got to get our teeth into it and, uh, and confirm the quality of the play that we believe we have. Well, fantastic, Som. I mean, um, great story. I love to, I'm, I'm very happy we, we caught on at the early stage, not when you've discovered something. And <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> keep, keep everyone up to date. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for your time, Noel. That's been very good.